Brethren, beginning in the book of 1 Samuel, we can begin to read about the kings of Israel and Judah. In 1 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 15, it says, And all the people, this is 1 Samuel 11, chapter 11, verse 15, it says, And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. There's the opening salvo, if you will, to a list of all different types of kings that we go through. And not much later, if we turn to chapter, just forward a few to chapter 15, 1 Samuel 15 and verse 1, it says, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me here to anoint you to be king over this people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. At that point, God gave Saul some very specific instructions that he was to carry out. And through the servant Samuel, he gave him that information. And yet we know that Saul failed to carry out those instructions of God. And we read that fallout a few verses later in 15 and verse 10. Because here it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, It repents me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me, and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And so started the up and down history of the evil and righteous kings of Judah and Israel. I found a chart in that most trustworthy of places, the internet, that listed 43 kings of Israel and Judah. There were a couple that uh, reigned over a combined nation, but 43 kings. And the interesting part, I wanted to understand, uh, wanted to confirm where it was that the listing of kings started, and that's where I came up with Saul in 1 Samuel. But it goes on to have a very um, interesting, there was one king that I was looking for, and it was interesting to see this chart because it has 43 kings. And according to that chart, only seven are recorded as good or righteous kings. Seven of 43. Four are listed with mixed results, like Solomon. It says that he was righteous in his youth. He did right before the Lord in his youth but evil in his later years. So we have 43 kings, seven good, four mixed. That leaves 32, or 75% of the kings that ruled over Israel and Judah that are biblically documented as evil or wicked rulers. Now, brethren, we aren't going to labor over or go through a, a distinct chronology of kings but as I mentioned, there was one in particular that I was looking for, and I wanted to turn to that one in the way of introduction today. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 1. We're going to read the passage here, talking about one of those kings. And in the progression, uh, he's about three-quarters of the way down. We'll read his story in 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. So we're talking here about the story, the life, the performance of King Hezekiah. Verse 2, he was 25 years old when he became king. And so that, you know, we, we start to think about that's, you know, less than half my age. I, I think of Nick in 10 more years as he prepared to become king of, king of a nation. Again, this, you know, very, very different times, but again, when we start to recognize the responsibility they had, and he certainly had a team of advisors around him and, and God and the prophets leading and such, but 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. <clears throat> but here's where things start to get important. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David, we really know actually that it is forefather, David wasn't his direct father, but that his father David had done. And it's important to catch the early part of that verse. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He understood the difference. He understood the difference and he chose the righteous path before God. Continuing in verse 4, it says, He removed the high places and he broke down the sacred pillars of, of men, not sacred before God as 
You know, sometimes we have altars and places of respect, and God had the tabernacle and such, but these were sacred places according to the practice of men. He cut down the wooden images and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it and called, and, uh, called it Nehushtan. Verse 5, And he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. Verse 6, For he held fast to the Lord, he did not depart from following him, but he kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered wherever he went. Now, brother, now I'd like to circle back and make two particular points about the description of Hezekiah that we read here before we move on in the sermon. In verse 6, we read that Hezekiah held fast to the Lord. Now, I read that from the New King James Version, and although that is an easier read, certain translations allow us to flow and understand and relate to certain words better, I think there's something lost in that concept. So I want to read it from the King James, the original, if you will. Verse 6 says, For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him. Now, brethren, other than perhaps a sermon, I don't believe I have ever used the word clave. And so I had to look it up. And the Hebrew word here is dawback. It's pronounced dawback. And it means to cling or adhere to. Now, cling makes me think of saran wrap. You know, when you're putting something in the, in the uh, refrigerator after dinner, and you want to keep any foreign objects out, you want to seal something in, you put that saran wrap that just adheres, it clings to. It does exactly the job you want to secure. So it, it has that concept of clinging to. Uh, it means to catch by pursuit, to closely follow on the heels of, or to overtake, to pursue hard, to chase after, to hunt after. He clave to the Lord. It gives us a flavor of the energy with which this righteous king sought God during his life. In verse 7, we see a second point made about Hezekiah and his relationship with Almighty God. It said, the Lord was with him. Now, we can read in several places where, okay, God blessed so-and-so. Or so-and-so sought out God and, and his wisdom at the moment, and so there was a blessing or there was support. But this is, this is meant in a global scale. This means in his life, God was with him. God was his partner. There was a strong and a lasting, a permanent, an eternal relationship that we read of with Hezekiah. And he prospered wherever he went. It was interesting in reading through and, and looking this, it says of no other king of Israel or Judah other than David. In 43 kings, only two of them are described by saying that the Lord was with them. In a permanent, loving close way God was with him. God blessed and prospered Hezekiah. And in the book of Second Chronicles, it tells us that God gave Hezekiah great wealth and caused him to succeed in every endeavor he had. You know, we can look back and maybe at least a portion of Job's life, we can look at the fact that with all the trials, but then God heaped on the opportunities and he blessed him in a great way because he had stood up under the trials that we heard. You know, we, we aren't always going to say, thank you, Father, thank you, give me some more. Come on, psh, hit, hit me on the other side. But the, what it generates in our character, if we look at it that way, and the strength and the character that it builds is a very positive thing. So God was with David, and God was with Hezekiah. And the reason for his success, as I mentioned, was more global in scale. It, it was his trust in his pursuit of God. Hezekiah's faith was not some simple role that he fulfilled as king. Well, you know, I've got to put on this crown, I've got to put on this robe, I need to do these, these little things, these ceremonies. We find that it was part of his character. We find that he went out through the land and he pulled down those things that were contrary to God. He made sure that the people were drawn back to God, that they reinstituted, reinstituted or reinitiated the practices that God had instructed them to do. He was all about pursuing and seeking after God. His faith was real and it extended the whole of his life and was evidenced by his pursuit and his efforts to please God. In Second Chronicles, there is a nice summary, if you will, a capstone to Hezekiah's life. In Second Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 32, it says, Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, behold, 
You know, it's almost like a trumpet is blasted at that point. All right? Hezekiah has now died, and these are the works. This is all of the story. Behold, pay attention. They are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, and in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So as we look back through the life of Hezekiah, we see that God was with him. God was pleased with him. God was chasing after him and staying close to him because of the efforts that he put forth. What will our story be, brethren? What will your story and my story be? Can we answer down deep in our souls that we cling to or adhere to God and his commandments? That we follow closely on his heels and that we overtake him by hard pursuit? I'll let that sink in for a moment. In fact, I want to repeat it in a moment. And I want to make sure that our young people, too, are thinking about that. Because there's a day in the not-too-distant future where all of our young people are going to have to make the decision about what you will pursue. And certainly, as parents and as brethren here, we pray that you'll search for God and seek for God in this same effort and to this same degree. And that all of us will as well, whether we are young or old. Can we answer down deep in our souls that we cling or adhere to God and his commandments? That we follow closely on his heels? That we overtake him by hard pursuit? Again, as Mr. Holloway say, I'm not looking for anybody to answer that out loud. Not looking for a raise of hands. That's something for us very often as we come up on Passover. We're digging deep. And we're thinking very personally about our commitment and our level of study and prayer and righteousness and what it is that we still have left to change in our lives. Brethren, we can turn to many passages in Scripture that describe a yearning to be in God's presence. And we will visit several of those passages during the sermon today. In fact, let's turn to the story of another king, another one of those very few that received positive grades from God. Let's turn to chapter 63 and verse 1. Because we talk about that yearning to be with God. And here it's described in verse 1 as a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Psalm chapter 63 and verse 1. It says, O God, thou art my God, and early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, and my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land. We see, see described for us here with one of the most basic and, yes, most intense physical needs that all human beings have, thirst, as a yearning for God. And so very often as we take the physical and we say, okay, uh, that helps me to relate to the spiritual. It's something that we've all experienced and we all understand. In any survival situation, there are certain basic important things that we have to prepare for, and those include shelter, water, fire, and food. And water is the second one there. You can't last very long without water. And David is, is showing us here that it's the same with God. If we don't thirst after, we become parched. We become dehydrated and it can be a deadly situation. Let's read some more references to that. It's a very common reference. In Psalm 42, in verse 1, another psalm of David here, it says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. If anybody has a dog in their life, you know on a hot day how that tongue hangs out and how that dog just sits there and pants. It's a way that God has given them to cool their bodies. In the same way, when it's, when it's the Day of Atonement that we'll do in just a month, you know toward the end of that how, how your tongue kind of sticks to the top of your mouth. You're hungry, your stomach's growling, and you can feel that. It's a very intense, it's a very, uh, something that we're keenly aware of. Psalm chapter 84 and verse 2. Psalm chapter 84 and verse 2, it says, My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord, and my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. So that concept of yearning, for thirsting, for hungering, is a very common thing to say that we should. We need that. So often it's referred to as we have this hole in our lives, and it's God that needs to fill it. And yet so many people look to every other opportunity, whether it be wealth, whether it be activities, whether it be alcohol or anything else like that. But we need God in our lives to fulfill that 
You know, it's like a vitamin that, that shores up one of the weaknesses, one of the, one of the uh, dependencies we have. Psalm chapter 119 and verse 131. Psalm 119 and 131, it says, I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Again, through these verses, we can see that David experienced a strong desire to seek out God and his instructions. And then it's interesting also to see that we're promised that those needs will be satisfied. So if we feel that yearning, we're not going to be out there left hanging. We're promised that those things will be satisfied. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. We've talked about hungering and thirsting and yearning, longing after. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, righteousness for they shall be filled. So for those that seek, those that pursue, those that yearn for it and work for it and chase after it, it will be found. John chapter 7 and verse 37. Again, on this concept of thirst, John chapter 7 and verse 37, it says, On that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus uh, stood and he cried aloud, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Con continuing or finishing in verse 38, it says, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And so if we'll pursue that, that thirst will be quenched, that hole will be filled. The question I asked earlier is, are we seeking? Are we pursuing? Are we following hard after on the heels of God? Time after time, we see this reference where God's servants have an intense desire to be near to God. And again, I mentioned atonement and that concept of hunger and thirst. Do we, brethren, feel that gnawing desire? You know, when we've, we've gotten away from, when we sometimes, if, if you're sick, if you're fatigued, if you're feeling under a lot of pressure and strain right now, it's not unusual. It's a human weakness for us to slide a little bit in our, in our prayer and our study. And yet when we do that, we have that gnawing. We have that, that, the spirit and the conscience that's that pushing us to say, you know what, you're, you're letting that hole grow because you haven't filled it like, it like it should, like it's promised. We need to get back to it. Rather a moment ago, I read from the beginning of Psalm 63, and I'd like to turn back there because David continues to paint the picture when he said that he, he thirsted as in a dry land. I'd like to turn back to Psalm 63 and verse 1 and read several verses here. Again, it starts out by saying, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you, for my soul thirsts for you, and my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So when you're thirsty and you go to the refrigerator and you get a drink, you satisfy, you quench that thirst. But when you're in a dry land, when you're out on the road or something and don't have the opportunity, it nags at you. It's there in that thirsty and dry place. Verse 2, so I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Again, that's that concept of searching out, seeking out. Verse 3, because your loving kindness is better than my life, or better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live, and I will lift up my hands in your name. So again, if you con picture the concept of David thinking out loud here and saying, you know, I, I yearn for you like a thirst, and I pray to you, and I praise you, and I glorify you, and I speak of you, and I meditate, and I think on you. You consume my thoughts. You are that first instinct. You are that first seeking that I have. Continuing in verse 5, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. So again, that hole will be filled, that hunger will be satisfied, that thirsting will be, will be quenched. Verse number 6, when I remember you on my, on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. How many times have we done that, whether we're falling asleep and we're meditating on something we thought? When we're working around the house and a hymn comes to mind and we find ourselves humming that from services. God is in our mind. He's in those early stages of our thought process. David talks about thinking of him during the night watches. As you can imagine, him walking the, the parapets of the, of the castle, you know, and, uh, and thinking of God in the night. Verse 7, because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. 
saying, I want to be near you. I want to be under your wing, like a mother hen does that to her chicks and protects them. Verse 8, my soul follows close behind you. There's that reference again to what we read about Hezekiah, how he, how he clung to God and he sought to overtake him through hard pursuit. David says, my soul follows close behind you and your right hand upholds me. I reach out to you for the strength that I need, for the protection of those wings, as we read a verse earlier. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. So when I have God's wings and his arms around me, it says if God is for us, who can be against us? So we have little to worry about when we're inside his protective. God is described as a fortress, and that protects us from the uh, challenges that we have around us. Verse 10, they shall fall by the sword, they shall be a portion for jackals, but the king shall rejoice in God. Speaking of himself there, everyone who swears by him shall glory, but the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. So again, we see David not only say that I yearn for God, but, but here's how I go about satisfying that. I spend time thinking and meditating and praying and considering. In my walking, when I rise up and when I lie down, David made God and his law a primary part of his life. Many of God's servants set a terrific example for us by seeking and pursuing all of the good things that God has. And their stories are recorded for us to embrace and internalize ourselves so that we find ourselves doing that same thing. I wonder if you noticed, just before, we, just before I came up here, the song we sang. I want to thank Mr. Williams for accommodating that request because it refers to one of those godly traits and it uses two terms to describe the effort that we as Christians are to exert in our quest for this and other righteous traits. We sang hymn number 23, Turn Thou From Evil, which is taken from Psalm chapter 34 and verse 14. Psalm chapter 34 and verse 14, it says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace, pursue it. Seek it, pursue it. Very often we get the, a repetition or we get two different words that mean slightly different things to, to accentuate what it is we're supposed to do. And there are those two words here. And each provides a little different description of how our efforts and our thoughts should be developing a relationship with God and developing the traits in our character that we see, peace being one of those. The word seek, just before peace, it says seek peace, pursue it. The word seek has the meaning of an emotional and a mental effort to find something. There's a reference to prayer, to making a request, and to striving after something in a thoughtful way. Education, to learn, to study, to pray, to meditate. It's more geared toward the head and the heart. When we play hide and seek, you imagine, we sometimes were cautious and we're watchful. We watch our youngsters doing it here sometimes during services. And I can, as soon as I read this, I thought of Ani. One, two, three, and you know, as the kids are all hiding, and then off she goes to seek, and she's, she's looking around corners. She, she's cautious, and she's looking very carefully for what it is. She's seeking something. And that's what this gives us the flavor, is that there are times that we seek something mentally, spiritually, emotionally, as opposed to physically. And so we seek after it. A couple of the times that it's used in uh, verses, it's uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, you can write down. 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14, it says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, there's that concept again, if they will humble themselves, that, that's a thought process, that's an action, not in a physical way, but they'll humble themselves spiritually and seek me through that prayer and meditation and change in their life and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Very often we find that when people seek God, when they pursue God, the blessings follow. God says, I want to be close to you. I want to bless my children. But those that sin, I withdraw myself from, because I won't operate in that same arena. And therefore we see that if we will pray and seek his face, that he will bless us. But that's that concept of seeking. In Psalm chapter 119 and verse 2, it said, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. So again, it's a heart and a mind type of thing. Do we spend time early in our day, throughout the day, humming a hymn, thinking of God, saying thank you in the, in the simplest of ways for the things that we have? 
Yes, there's that deep, heartfelt prayer that we have when we're going through a trial. But it can happen dozens of times. Thank you, Father. That was beautiful. That could have gone far worse than it did. So many ways that we can thank God and just be mindful of Him throughout the day. Psalm chapter 119 and verse 10, just a little bit later in that chapter. With my whole heart I have sought you. O oh, let me not wander from your commandments. So with my heart and with my mind, I'm constantly in touch with you. I'm in tune with you. And your commandments, your law, your instructions, they're on my mind. And so when I go to do something, I'm considering, is this okay? One of my major responsibilities at work is human resources. And so with almost 200 employees and all the policies that we have, Everybody that comes to us and says, well, this is not clear. Now, here's somebody, maybe one of our employees did something special. They went above the, and beyond the call of duty. And I want to do this. I said, guys, whenever you want to do something, please come see me. Because I read through that handbook constantly. And I know the history of what we've done. And I know our union contract and how that comes into play. And I have to consider all of those because I say, you know, what you want to do has merit, but we can't do it that way because that creates a conflict with page 27 and subchapter 6. And so, you know what? We can do the good thing you want to do, but we need to do it wisely and thoughtfully, and we need to do it this way. And so when we do that, when we meditate on God's law, what we're doing is we're putting that handbook in our hearts and our minds. We're seeking to understand so that everything that comes up, we can say, yeah, no problem. That's a slam dunk. Or, no, wait a minute, Let, let's change that. All it needs is a little different color and we can go with it. So, that again, it's the heart, it's the mind, it's the understanding. Let me not wander from your commandments. The second term used in Psalm chapter 34 and verse 14 is pursue. It said, seek peace, pursue it. And there's a slightly different concept to pursuit. We often could use them interchangeably, but again, if we go back, that's why very often we want different translations or different study uh, uh, materials because they help us to understand in a, in a deeper way and in a more complete way. That term pursue, it has a much more active tone to it. It means to run after. It means to chase. It means to hunt down. It's like running hard at the heels of. You know, when you're running a race and you're in second place, you're hot on the heels of somebody. You're trying to make that jump to first place. We watch the NASCAR and you watch how they draft each other. They're, they're just waiting for their opportunity to move. They're hot on the heels. They're in hot pursuit of the person in front of them. And we need to do that to God. Cling to him. Pursue him. Chase him down. John Wesley's notes on the Old and New Testament says this of that term. It says, do not only embrace it gladly when it's offered, but follow hard after it, even when it seems to flee away from you. So life is not always going to be easy. You know, if all those good gifts just showed up at the door, if the doorbell rang every day and the UPS man just left a huge box of blessings every day, life would be easy. But we have to go get them. We have to pursue after them. We have to sometimes push the challenges of life aside in order to lay hold on, to clave to, what God puts in front of us and expects us to chase. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 9. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 9 in this concept of pursuing or chasing or hunting down. It says, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he, God, loves him that follows after righteousness. Follows after righteousness. And that is that term, to chase after even when it doesn't come easy. You know, very often, the last couple of messages we've had have talked about that conscience on our shoulder, the good and the bad, saying, well, this, this sounds fun. They're all doing it. It's an opportunity to make more money, to drive a shiny car, to be with the in crowd. But we have to pursue righteousness. And sometimes it comes at the cost of those. It doesn't always. You know, God says to seek first the kingdom of God. He doesn't say seek only. Kids, you can go make a million dollars. That million dollars will allow you to support your family and contribute to worthwhile causes, and it can buy some degree of happiness. It doesn't say you have to give up all your money and, and live you know, a destitute life, but it says seek first. Make a priority in your life. That heart and that mind, seeking God's law and his commandments and have them humming that tune when you wake up in the morning, rolling out of bed and getting on your knees, even if it's just for a few minutes while that, man, a cup of coffee, 
I'm going to do these minutes first. So seek first. Make it your initial thought, even when it doesn't come easy. As I searched the examples for that Hebrew word, I found it interesting that we're not the only ones that do the pursuing. In Psalm chapter 23 and verse 6, you know, we're, we're, we say here that we're supposed to keep the commandments, when we're supposed to follow God's instruction, and we, we, we come to church, and we go to the holy days, and there's a lot we have to do and chase and participate in and grab a hold of and keep up with. But Psalm 23, verse 6 has a very interesting twist. It says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That follow is the word pursue. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So David, when he had that yearning, that thirst, that hunger, that desire, he became the type of person that God said, You know what? My grace, my blessing will pursue you. It will be hard at your heels. It will be alongside you when you are righteous, when you are my child, when you seek me. So again, interesting. We go a long way to pursue God's blessings. And God says that his blessings and mercy will stay hard on our heels if we are seeking him too. It's, it's like that, you know, it's, if you've ever played tag with your dad on the beach or your mom on the beach, you know, and you're, ha ha, you're it, you're it. And it, it's kind of, I'm chasing you, you're chasing me. And that's what God says basically, that if you'll follow me, I'll be right back there. Oh yeah? Okay, I'll do one better. And God's constantly with us. His mercy and his blessings will pursue us if we pursue him. Let's turn back to Psalm chapter 34 and read about how God is attentive to the needs of those that seek him. Talking about that, that tag, that game of tag on the beach. 34.14, let me go back and read it to make sure I got it all. 34.14 says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So we know that God doesn't like those that seek evil and do wicked. But he said, Seek peace. One of my gifts. One of my character traits. And it goes on in verse 15. It says, Because the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. So when we know... What did it say about Hezekiah? He did what was right in the sight of the Lord or before the Lord. He knew the difference and he took the high road. He showed the character and the commitment to live God's way. It says, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cries. So when we have requests, when we make those prayers, whether he answers them or not, but he hears them, he's in tune with them. He's deciding, okay, here's what you want, and, you know, but I, I know what's going to happen tomorrow and next year. And, and I know what you need, your strengths and weaknesses, and what the right help meet, what the right spouse would be for you. And so those unanswered prayers, they're a constant loving calculation of our Father in Heaven about what's best and right for us. He hears our cries. He hears our questions and our requests. Verse 16, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Are, are our deeds, is our character, is our performance written of in the book of life? If it's righteous, God says, yes, those things are recorded for righteousness' sake. We know that the evil, the wicked, are cut off. And yet it also says that if the wicked man will put away those things, turn back to me, and live in a righteous way, I'm quick. Again, that grace is quick, and that love is quick to forgive. Verse 17, the righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. I mentioned Job earlier, and you know, you can look at it and say, wait a minute, he didn't deliver Job out of his troubles. See, yes, he did. It says, I will never test you beyond what you're capable. And we know that he took Job probably right to the edge of what he was capable of. But what did it do? It showed Job what he was capable of. God knew, because originally when Satan said, you know, come on, let me add him. Well, okay, but not, come on, let me add him a little more. Okay, but not this. Come on, let me, let me make it hurt a little bit. And God said he knew what, his, what Job was capable of. And so he took him right to the edge. And then he blessed him immensely, as he did with Hezekiah. So again, the righteous cry in the Lord hears. And he delivers them ultimately out of all their troubles. We have to remember that word ultimately, if you will, because it says we will have trials. We will have tribulations. We will learn what our capacity is by what God pushes us to. So we know we can help someone else, and we maybe can grow to even have greater capacity ourselves for the next time around. Verse 18, the Lord is near unto them 
of a broken heart and save such as be of a contrite spirit. So if our head and our hearts are in the right place, if we're patient and loving enough to feel the needs of somebody else instead of just charging forth on our treasure hunts, then God says those that are of broken heart, those that are mindful of other things, a contrite spirit, respectful, aware, in touch with, the Lord is near unto them. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. So there it goes back to the fact that life won't always be easy, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones and none of them are broken. Evil shall slay the wicked and they that hate righteousness shall be desolate. Verse 22, but the Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. It says none that depend on him will find themselves lost or alone. In Hebrews 13, God promises that he'll never leave us or forsake us. And we know that he'll never let us down if we stick close to him, if we're hard on his heels. Even when difficult times come, even when we're fatigued and tired, we may, only, we may not be sprinting anymore, we may be plodding at his heels, but we're making the effort. We're as close as we can be at that time, and God applauds that. Let's look at a number of other scriptures on the topic. I mentioned that we would turn to several. We've talked about seeking God and, and being in pursuit of Him and Hezekiah that did things right before the Lord and made his life geared toward following God and reap the blessings for it. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29, it says, But if you shall seek the Lord your God from there, you shall find Him. And if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. So again, do we have that yearning? Do we seek and search and pursue and look for God and his character and his righteousness and his blessing by keeping his commandments and keeping him close to us? Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13. It says, and you shall seek me and find me, then you shall search for me with all your heart. So again, this is, not a, this is not a quick and easy thing. God's expecting to see effort on our part. He said, life is going to be difficult. Life is going to be challenging. Life is going to be very rewarding. We have to look for all the good in it as well, instead of walking around, woe is me. And yet those trials do make us stronger. They make us more aware, more experienced, more capable of showing that love and helping others through the same type of trials. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 17. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 17. It says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Early doesn't mean early in the morning, although that's a very good trait. The idea here is that we turn to God as our first instinct, not our last hope. And so when something happens, instead of trying to make it ourself, our first, our first reaction is to step back and say, wait a minute, okay, what's right? What's wrong? What's fair and honest? What happened? Did I contribute to this? Am I part of the problem? That The whole concept is going back to God's law and say, how does it all apply? Father, how do you see this? Let me put myself temporarily in your shoes. Because what's the truth of the matter? Very often our heart says, well, you know, it really wasn't wasn't my fault, really. Well, it could have been, could have been part of it. We've got to be honest with ourselves. Father, where's my shortfall? Help me through that, and then let me grow and proceed and succeed through it. The idea of turning to God is our first instinct rather than our last hope. Of course, this concept of priorities, talking about being our first instinct or our first turn, is spoken of or referred to in one of the most referred to scriptures in God's word, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And I responded to, or referred to it earlier. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek, consider, meditate on, study, pray about, know what it is that you're going to have to apply in your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you, as they were to David, as they were to Daniel, as they were to Job, as they were to Hezekiah. Brethren, again, we very often look at the scriptures and we go, well, I, I'm just Joe Schmo, and I live in West Seneca or I live in Hamburg or I live in a little town of Eden and I'm not a king of Israel. 
but those were still men. Queen Esther was still a woman that sought after, that pursued God in the way they lived, in the way they learned, in the way they evaluated their life in every situation they were in. So we have to recognize that just because we're not a king, we still have those things to do and to learn and to succeed at. Consider back to the opening story of King Hezekiah and how this passage in Matthew directly supports that. What happened to the righteous servant of God and his people. In verse 3 it said, He did what was right before the sight of the Lord. And there in Matthew it says, Seek you first God's kingdom and his righteousness. So if you're seeking to be like him and to understand him, you're doing what Hezekiah did. And so again, we can start to say, you know what? I have tendencies to kingship. And you're all going to be. And so we need to be preparing today as that Cinderella story to say, you know what? I'm waiting for God to finish this. But I'm developing as many of the character traits as I can ahead of time. You know, when Cinderella was in her rags and riches, she was still taking care of the mice. She was still taking care of her family. The qualities that were inside and invisible to some were there. And it was that magical moment that brought it out. We need to be doing that same thing. So verse 3 said, He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Verse 7 said, The Lord was with him and prospered wherever he went. So when we seek after and pursue after our Father in heaven, we also have the promises that success is on our heels. Let's turn to just a few more verses ahead in the book of Matthew to chapter 7 and verse 7. This concept of seek you first and these blessings will follow. Think of me early in every situation and I will be there. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, it says, Ask and it shall be given to you. These are promises. These are A plus B equals C. They're in stone. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. My grace, my mercy, my blessings will be hard at your heels if you're seeking me. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Brethren, these are all scriptures that we've read dozens if not hundreds of times around across the year and each time we read them in a context of a particular message we it expands our thought process and next time will you think early will you hum a hymn because it's buried somewhere deep in your heart and your mind will you pick up a particular verse and say man I I heard this two weeks ago or six weeks or ten years ago but it is so applicable to the situation I'm going through right now and I hope and I pray that I react in the way that I should because God came early. God's commandments came early to my thought process. That's told to us again. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 is told to us again in Luke chapter 11 and verse 9. And I say unto you, Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So when we seek and pursue and yearn after and hunger for and do what's right in the sight of God, those things shall be open to us. Let me ask you again the question I posed earlier, brethren. What will our story be? Can we answer down deep in our souls that we cling or adhere to God and His commandments, that we follow closely on His heels, that we overtake Him by hard pursuit? My daughter Alexa loves horses, and so all the time there's pictures of horses, or I'll walk by the computer and there on the screen is horses. And what so often do you see about that newborn horse? You know, mom is running around the corral, and here's this little unstable, but right on the heels of, sticking close to mom and dad. We see the fawns running through the woods right now. Mom hops the road, slow down, because here comes the little ones right behind, close on the heels, following hard after, desiring to stay close. Do all those things. You know, it says, think of me early. Do all those things help us to relate to God. All those little things in life. It's funny, there's hundreds of little things that can happen to you during the day that if we're thoughtful of God, if our heart and our mind are in the right place, we think early. We think first. We relate to a scripture or a thought. And that's what God says. Keep me close. Keep me close. Let me ask that question another way and use several verses to, uh, as we begin to wind down the message here. Do we spend enough time seeking and pursuing God and His righteousness? 
seeking and pursuing godliness or God's righteousness. I mentioned earlier, we know that un we understand our performance sometimes lags. If we're sick or if we're ill or if we're fatigued or if we're worried about somebody, we can find ourselves distracted. But seek and pursue we must. Psalm chapter 119, we've been in Psalms many times because David writes so, so extensively about it. Psalm chapter 119, verse 16, David said, I will delight myself in your statutes and I will not forget your word. Nothing will get in the way. Nothing will take precedent. Psalm chapter 119 and verse 103. Verse 103. How sweet are your words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. We talked about the thirst and the need to satisfy that thirst. Or it can become difficult, it can become dangerous. And here now you have the hunger, you have the taste, you have that, that savoring. I gave the sermon not long ago about pleasant words are like a honeycomb. What was it? Health to the bones and sweet to the soul and health to the bones. And here it says that your word is like honey. I savor it. It's rich. It's healthy. Honey never goes bad. Honey has health-giving qualities. How sweet are your words. Brethren, I know that some of you have read God's word from cover to cover perhaps several times. You know, if you were to read the Bible at what most consider, perhaps the speed I'm speaking at today, a standard reading speed, slow enough to be heard and understood, it said the reading time is estimated to be 71 hours. 71 hours. If you divide that by 365 days, you could read the entire Bible, cover to cover, in only 12 minutes a day. 12 minutes a day. And I'm not saying that that ought to be one of our goals, to read cover to cover. We know there's meditation time, there's praying time. Before we start to study, we should come to God and say, Father, in prayer, I pray that what I'm about to put in, the hunger and thirst I'm about to satisfy, help me to expand on it, to really understand it. Help it to become clear. But 12 minutes a day. Do we sometimes struggle to give it 12 minutes a day? And I'm not here to say that we should study 30 minutes a day or pray an hour a day or you know, pray three times a day at, at morning, noon, and night. And that's between us, but the question we're driving at in the message is do we seek? Do we pursue? Are we hard on the heels of? Only you can answer that question. So again, find the time to seek and pursue God, the heart and the head, the seeking, the, the mental and the spiritual understanding, and then the pursuit of activities and fellowship and staying on the heels of God. Remember what we read in Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 17? God said, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early, those who are constantly in tune with me, shall find me. Do we give God our first and our best? in our time, in our tithes, in our meditations and considerations? Does God get our first and our best in all we do? Psalm chapter 16 and verse 11. Psalm chapter 16 and verse 11. Again, as our pursuit of God happens, where do we find ourselves? What, what is there for us? It says, you will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. Mr. Holloway said, we're supposed to count it all joy when we fall into trials. Those two are not mutually exclusive, and yet it doesn't mean you always have to have a trial either before you find joy. So when we study and we pray, when we, when we suddenly have that word clave that comes clear to us and say, okay, now, now I understand God's word just a little bit better, and I feel a warmth, I feel a satisfaction that, Father, you have opened my mind to understand just a little bit more. Thank you. Because now I have a different way to talk to my children, as I have a responsibility as a father, when we rise up and when we lie down and when we walk in the way. You know, when Nick and I were doing wood in the crick a week ago, you can tell I'm from the country, I say crick. Um, but but we, were, we were working and I was throwing stuff from the bottom of the creek. There had been a tree that had fallen down into the rapids and then we had a real big rain and it pushed it. So I cut it all up and there's a, in the, the waterfall near us, there's a, there's a first stage that's about this high. And so I was taking them up and I was 
heaving them up on there. And then I'd have to go back down and get another piece. And Nick was rolling them up. And, and I said, hey, Nick, I'm, I'm beating you. There's, the pile's filling up. He goes, yeah, yeah. So I jumped up there and I said, come on, ready, go. And we ran back. Okay, we're grabbing them, we're throwing We're grabbing them, throwing Just that, I was hard on his heels. It became a competition. Come on, let's do it. Yeah, we, we can plod along. Is that how we pursue God? Or are we hard on his heels? Do we, do we strive for it? Do we grab a hold of it? Are we running it like the mutter? Are we putting in that second mile and that third and that eighth? Or have we said, you know what? Okay, I'm, I'm going to sit down on the side and I'm going to wave to those that are going by. Gut it out. Make it work. Give it your best. Give it your all. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 4, it says, you, uh, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. So Deuteronomy also tells us that we are to cleave to, to cling to, to embrace, just like King Hezekiah did. And we know that God was with him in all he did. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. God's promises are from cover to cover. I love those who love me. I wish I have my blessing basket here. Please come get some. Choose this way of life. And we'll play tag on the beach. Those who pursue God will not be disappointed. John chapter 14 and verse 23. Had I had a couple more days, I was thinking about giving you this list of scriptures in written form so you didn't have to scratch them all down, but I didn't get that far. John chapter 14 and verse 23. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So, brethren, as we seek that relationship, as we speak to cleave to, to stay close on the heels of, to be in reaching distance, God wants to do that. He's waiting for us. But if a man love me, these good things will happen. If a woman loves me and pursues me and seeks me, remembers my commandments and does those statutes, we will live with him or her. Recall what we read earlier in Psalm chapter 23 and verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow, pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Brethren, I find that just kept coming back to my mind as I was making the message. I have a responsibility to pursue. We have a responsibility to commit and stay committed. And I mentioned earlier to our children that that decision will become yours sometime in the not too distant future. We all have to be setting a good example for that. But when we do that, when we make that effort, when we reach out, when we take that step and that next one, it said God's mercy and blessings will pursue us. And that's a satisfying thought. It's, a, it's an interesting twist that I just kept coming back to and coming back to. Brethren, we see the difficulties in the world around us, and our efforts and our focus should be on aligning ourselves with our Father in heaven and depending on the promises that he has made so clear for us both for our present day lives as he encourages us and blesses us and drives us and draws us forward but also in looking forward to eternity that blessing of his kingdom in the future when we will all be kings and what will our story be what will be said of us Psalm chapter 23 and verse 1 as I kind of look move into this what are the blessings of God we find that in your righteousness in your presence is an extreme joy. Psalm 23, 1. We all have read Psalm 23 many times. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So as I go about my daily activities, I have somebody to guide me, to coach me, to help me, to, to pull me out of the ditch when I get there. That's why that shepherd's crook. 
you know, it's got, a, it's got one end that can kind of be a prod. It's got the other side that is a hook. So if you're caught in the thorns or you're in a ditch, I can, I can, get, I can lift you out of that. It was a very real and very effective tool. And the Lord is my shepherd. He can pull me out of anything that I find myself in if I seek him, if I'm willing, if I'm interested. Verse 2, he makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. Brethren, there are times that we like to live fast and successful and work is challenging and, and uh, you know, competition can be exhilarating. But there are times that we look for the peace and the quiet and the calm of life and he makes us to lie down in green pastures and leads us beside the still waters. Verse 3, he restores my soul and leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We talked earlier about the fact that those that seek me will not be desolate. He will restore the souls of those. And so we know in our times of need, we have a power, we have a strength, we have a, a guardian that will look down on us and serve us in that way. The accounts of David and Hezekiah and so many other servants of God speak to the great peace and happiness that can be found in the pursuit after and the company of God and his law and his brethren. We're also bolstered, we're strengthened when we are at each other's heels, when we're playing tag. Hey, wake up. Hey, did, did, were you here? Were you there? It was good to see you at the picnic last week. All those things are those little tags, those little touches that we get from family that keeps us thinking first, thinking early, of God and his people and his commandments and his holy days. The accounts of David and Hezekiah, as I mentioned, show us that great peace and happiness. And brethren, that should be our personal quest. You know, I've used the word seek and pursue and quest might be another word that we think of this way when we seek God. A quest is defined as a long or arduous search for something important. A quest is a long or arduous search for something important. And such a search often includes a journey, an adventure. Mankind has gone on quests for many things down through time. They've searched for knowledge, for power, for glory, for treasure, for thrills. We read of it in the Crusades and in the search for the Holy Grail and the Fountain of Youth. Brethren, our lives as seekers and followers of God's way finds us on a spiritual journey that will take us the rest of our days. And if you watch the movie series Indiana Jones, you understand the concept of a quest because Indy was always involved in some hair-raising search for something important, something valuable, some treasure that was out there. It was always epic, it seemed, in his life. Our quest may not drag us to the four corners of the globe, and yet it may. For the feast, some have cruised the Mediterranean, been to all corners of the globe, getting together with the brethren where God places his name. But regardless, like Hezekiah and Daniel and David and Esther, we should be pursuing godliness and God's promises to lead us on that quest and deliver us out of any difficulties we encounter on the way. Twice now, brethren, I've asked the question, what will our story be? When our days come to an end and our name comes up in conversation, what will the comments be? He or she was nice, tough, funny, great hair, successful business person, good parent, fantastic sense of humor, snazzy dresser, dependable, great athlete. I want to have someone quote 2 Kings chapter 18. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, for he held fast, he clave to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, so that he prospered wherever he went. Brethren, what will be your story? It's time for our quest. It's time to start pursuing our future today.